Welcome to the chapter 13 lecture video. I don't have any video or intro for this one because it's the last one and I couldn't really think of anything for interspecific competition or like anything in my house to show you. So we'll just jump right in. Uh, this is going to be the last lecture for exam two. So as always, make sure to pull up your learning goals from the study guide and fill them in as we go along. So we've talked about intraspecific competition, which is competition between individuals of the same species. We've talked about interspecific interactions between two different species. Now let's talk specifically about competition between two different species. There are multiple different kinds of interspecific competition, and we're gonna go through um, six main types of competition in this lecture. So first, let's talk about consumption. Consumption is when individuals of one species inhibit individuals of another by consuming a shared resource. I'll repeat that so you don't have to rewind. Consumption is when individuals of one species inhibit individuals of another by consuming a shared resource. So, uh, really common thing you can think of is two species A and species B both eat the same food. One of them eats it before the other one gets to it. That's consumption. Preemption is occupation by one individual precludes establishment by others. So mostly this one applies to sessile organisms that, you know, can't physically usually interact like in a in a close proximity to their competitors but um you know maybe like a sea anemone oh sea anemone is a good one because i have that invasive sea anemone in my tank um so it's something that can come in and colonize like a new rock or something or maybe a new grassland or a newly exposed area before something else does so that's preemption overgrowth is when one organism literally grows over another one. They may or may not have physical contact, so they could just like shade out the other organism. Um, and what they're doing is inhibiting access to some essential resource. So this could be, uh, you see this pretty common with plants. They grow over each other and control their access to light. Um, one common, ex one example I can think of right away of overgrowth is porcelain berry which is really, I mean, it has pretty little like purple grape kind of things on it. It looks kind of similar to grape uh, vines, but it's like a highly invasive species, especially here in Pittsburgh. And it just kind of like, it grows kind of like kudzu, which is another good example of overgrowth competition. It just grows over trees um, in like huge masses and just like covers them like a blanket. So that's overgrowth. Uh, you can also have chemical interactions. So chemical interaction is when um, chemical growth inhibitors or toxins are released by an individual um, and they inhibit or kill other species. So this is when a species uses chemical growth inhibitors or toxins to inhibit or kill other species. Um, one special type of chemical interaction that's pretty common is called allelopathy. This is specifically re referring to plants, and it's what's illustrated here, is allelopathy is when chemicals produced by some plants inhibit germination and establishment of other species. Uh, one really common example of allelopathy, which we would have done this lab if we were not just doing stuff outdoors. But anyway, um, black walnuts produce um, a chemical in their roots called jugone, um, or is it jugalone? No, now I'm thinking of juggalos. I think it's called jugone. They produce this allelopathic chemical in their roots, black walnut trees do. So usually if you see a black walnut tree, you see kind of like a clearing around the base of it because the roots only extend out as far as the uh, leaves on the tree do. And so you'll see like a clearing because of the jugone that they produce in the soil inhibits the growth of other uh, plants that could grow underneath it. We should look for these. Uh, I know there's a few black walnuts out at Winnie Palmer. We should look for them the next time we're outside. 
Anyway, this is kind of just a diagram example of um, an allelopathic donor. Well, this one's from the leaves. I guess it could be from the roots too. But this is just an example of allelopathy, which is a type of chemical interaction. You can also have territoriality, which results from the behavioral exclusion of other species from a specific space that is defended as a territory. Now, I think this is kind of like the classic example because humans love stuff that reminds us of us. And so we think, I think people are particularly fascinated by animal behavior. And so like the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of competition is territoriality. So animals like defending or fighting each other off over a resource. Um, I always, you know, because you think of competition, you think of a battle. The sixth one is encounter. So this results when non-territorial -ter meanings between individuals negatively affect one or both participants. So this is just um, not direct competition and fighting and territoriality, but there is like a meeting between um, individuals of a species and they just end up negatively affecting one or both of the individuals. So those are the six types of interspecific competition. Now let's talk about the Lotka Volterra model. So your textbook goes into like graduate level descriptions of the Lotka, Lotka Volterra model and I do not expect you to know nearly as much detail as is in that chapter. But I do want you to know about the three possible outcomes of interspecific competition that you can have with the Lodka Volterra model because these outcomes are basically the alternative hypotheses that you're testing when you do an ecological study of competition. And I have inserted these awesome gifts from Godzilla movies to help you understand it better. Um, in your book, it's got four outcomes. We're going to, for this lecture, just talk about three because outcome one and outcome two are basically the same. So outcome one, also outcome two in the book, is when one species always wins, leading to the extinction, extinction of the other species. So this is, um, yeah, look, he's, he's, making a, he's making King Kong go bye-bye. So... This is when two species are competing in an environment and the other one takes resources away from the other species so much that it leads to their extinction in that specific environment. So the two outcomes that they list in your textbook are species A wins over species B, it makes it go extinct, and species B wins over species A, it makes species A extinct. Basically, it's the same outcome just depending on if you're referring to species A or species B, which is why we're collapsing it into one outcome. The other outcome is um, each species inhibits the growth of its own population more than that, th than that of the other by interspecific competition. So the species end up coexisting. So um, We'll talk about this a little later on, but it, it, in no real environmental scenario do you have 100% complete competitors that occupy the exact same niche. Um, so one species A might inhibit its own growth um, by switching to another resource or doing something else, but something happens, each species is controlling its own growth enough that it doesn't cause the other species to go extinct. Don't ask me which Godzilla movie this is. I'm not sure which one it is. I don't know who that guy, who that kaiju is. And then outcome three slash four in your textbook is that each species inhibits the growth of the other more than its own growth. Um, so this is when a species might may or may not be directly or indirectly um, competing with the other species. So maybe it's any number of the examples of competition that we talked about, but it is inhibiting the growth of the other one more than its own, and eventually just the one that has 
more individuals and can use more of the resources that they're both competing for, that one will often win out um, and either cause a large decline or extinction of the other species. So I included this gift from Game of Thrones because clearly, even though, I guess this isn't a great example because, you know, Jon Snow always wins, but there's a lot more individuals of this quote-unquote species, and so uh, under this outcome of the Lack of Oterra model, they would win out over Jon Snow. But Jon Snow knows nothing, so... Anyway, okay, so let's talk about where the Lack of Oterra model actually came from. There are some really classic experiments done with Paramecium, that helped um, develop this model. So in the 1930s, Gauss, um, who you might have heard of in a statistics class, um, in the 1930s, Gauss did these experiments with uh, two different Paramecium species, Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum. Um, there are some pictures right there. Uh, Paramecium aurelia has um, a higher rate of population growth than P. caudatum and can tolerate living at a higher population density. Um, so in these experiments, um, Gauss fed them a fixed amount of bac bacterial food, which is what they both feed on, um, and you can see the outcomes of that competition over the day. So what happens is that um, Oh, yeah, here. So you can see that if it's grown on its own, it reaches much higher um, population densities. Um, if it's grown in a mixed population with mixture of P. caudatum and P. aurelia, P. aurelia will have a, a smaller population density, but it does um, seem like it causes the near extinction of P. caudatum. So in this scenario, um, P. aurelia would be the superior competitor. So this, um, yeah. And that's because um, P. aurelia has a higher rate of population growth, and so because it can grow quicker before P. caudatum, it allows it to over-colonize the environment and cause the suppression of P. caudatum. Okay, um, they, uh, Gauss also grew this uh, Paramecium caudatum with a third Paramecium species called P. bursaria, and what happened is that they ended up coexisting because P. caudatum fed on bacteria that were suspended in the solution, and P. bursaria fed on bacteria at the bottoms of the tube, so they actually kind of separated into their own niches within the cultures that they were growing in and so which I think is really cool so that would be outcome two is that they both P. caudatum and P. bursaria ended up growing together in culture and then I would say that this is probably it doesn't look like the P. caudatum went completely extinct so that is probably outcome three especially since the reason that uh, P. aurelia outcompetes P. caudatum is because it just takes over the space before P. caudatum uh, has the ability to grow its population size. This is another experiment that kind of demonstrates um, support for the Latka Volterra model of the different outcomes of interspecific competition. So this is an experiment that was done with diatoms. Um, I'm, I can't remember what AF and SU stand for, but it's the genus. That's why it's capital and lowercase. This is the genus, and that's the species name. So it's two different species of diatoms, which are these tiny uh, planktonic organisms that live in the ocean. And if you've ever read about diatoms before, they have a kind of a, a like casing made out of silica. And so the limiting resource in these experiments was silica in the environment that allows them to make their test that goes around and encases them. When they're grown together, um, the SU species reduces silica to a point 
at which AF ends up dying out. So this is what they look like with grown alone, and then here's what they look like growing together, and this is because um, SU significantly reduces the silica in the environment, um, and then AF dies out. So that would be out outcome one, where one species causes the extinction of the other because it's a superior competitor. So I kind of already talked a little bit about the competitive exclusion pin principle when I was talking about P. caudatum and the P. berseria experiment, where they both ended up living in the same culture medium, but in different parts of the jar. Um, so this competitive exclusion principle is the idea that a complete competitor cannot coexist. So I'll say that again. Complete competitors cannot coexist. In theory, if you did have two species that had the exact same ecological requirements, think about what would happen. Do, 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 do. What's that? Oh, you're right. One species would go extinct because they can't live and inhabit the exact same resources at the exact same time. You're so smart. You're all so smart. Um, so this, the competitive exclusion principle isn't based on any real scenario, but, um, it kind of helps determine how similar two species can be to each other and still coexist in an environment, which is why, even though it's not a realistic principle, it's important for understanding, um, specialization in different niches and understanding interspecific interspecific competition because it allows you to think about how close two species can be without um interfering with each other and still coexist um this principle has also caused researchers to look at non-consumable resources too so some of the best examples of competition are when um, you're thinking about resources that are consumed, so mostly food, um, because it's, it's really easy to understand why, uh, an organism might flourish or perish if it did or did not have food. But because of this principle, researchers have started to look at non-consumables too, and how they play a role in interspecific competition. So for this one that's here, for these warblers, um, this is a non-consumable resource. They're, this is a nesting habitat as opposed to like a food resource. Um, and so, oh, but they actually, it's a food resource too. So they're feeding in this part of the tree. Um, and so they're separating out where they feed in the different parts of the tree so that they don't end up competing with each other for food if they end up in the same area. So this is like a niche specialization. So let's talk about the effect of non-resource factors on competition because besides that warbler example, we've mostly only talked about um, food. Okay, so um, this is a study that was done in Rocky Mountains. This is a picture I included of the Rocky Mountains that I took last summer when I was visiting um, a colleague who was doing research on bumblebees there. I think it's hands down, the this is the, the view from the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Gothic, Colorado, and I think hands down it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been on Earth. So you should definitely go, because it's right here in the US. Um, anyway, this study was done on Rocky Mountain trout. So I was looking at brook, brook trout, brown trout, and creek chub. Um, brook trout, are most abundant at high elevations. Brown trout are more abundant at middle elevations, and then creek chub are more abundant at lower elevations. And so what this lab did um, in Rocky Mountain, and they might have even actually done it here at Rumble, R-M-B-L, because um, I remember seeing some weird fish ponds up at the front when I entered the research facility. Anyway, they probably did it here at Rumble. They made these simulated stream scenarios where they made all of these three species live together to see if the competitive exclusion principle might be why 
They've separated out at different elevations within the Rocky Mountains in terms of their habitat. Um, so when they force them into these um, simulated stream scenarios, um, what they found was that the temperature optima um, for the three different species was different based on the elevation that they lived at. So um, and the temperature that they raised the organisms at influenced their consumption rates and each have a different temperature at which they consumed the most. So temperature changes in the water with elevation, which we've talked about before. So it's probably cooler more of the time up at higher. Actually, oh my gosh, this picture is perfect for that. So this is a higher, this is, this is still pretty high elevation. I think this is still like 10,000 feet the base of the research facility, but that's even higher, right? So, um, and you can see it, it's more tundra-like up here. There's not a lot of vegetation. There's still even snow at the high peak of the summer season. This was in August? No, end of July that I visited. So at this high elevation site, um, the temperatures are cooler, and down here, they're lower. And so you can see that at the lowest water temperature, look who consumed the most food. It was the brook trout, which is the one that lives at the highest elevations. And so this one, because it's um, specialized into a high elevation niche where it's colder, they're more, they have a higher competitive advantage at colder temperatures. And then at the warmest temperature would be at the lower elevations, the creek chub went out, and then at the middle temperatures, which is mid elevations, the brown trout run out, went out. Really cool, very elegantly designed experiment to look at competition. Now let's talk about um, how temporal variation in the environment can influence how two species might interact with each other. So, what temperature can do is it shifts the relative competitive abilities of species. Um, and then climate can function as a density independent way to limit population growth. Um, so in this graph here, this is looking at um, dom two do dominant grass species in a savanna community in southwest Zimbabwe. And so this is the pattern of rain over the year. And you can see when the rainfall is its lowest, so this would be the dry season, uh, the driest part of the rainy season in Zimbabwe, this species is better adapted to dealing with this low, lower water availability because we're still in the rainy season. So the Eurococloa, oh boy, Mozambicensis, at least I can pronounce that part. This one is needs less water. And then during like the heavy part of the rainy season, um, the heteropogon, which does better in higher water content, will outcompete the Euro Choloa. <laughs> um, it will outcompete it. So, and this is all based on the seasonality of water availability across the year. So, two species, what we haven't talked about is temporal variation yet. Um, we've talked about non resources. Now, over time, you might see different species occurring at different times throughout the year um, based on their competitive ability, based on the climate at different times of year. The other thing is that the, that's not really covered by the Lodka Volterra model, which is still useful, um, even though it's very simplified, is that usually when you're thinking about competition between two species, they're not just competing for one resource against each other that's going to determine who wins out or who doesn't. Usually they're competing for multiple resources. So this was an experiment that was done on a skeleton weed, which is a noxious weed here, um, and then subterranean clover, which is, I don't think it's technically considered a, oh, maybe Taylor, maybe you know about this because it's used as forage ground cover for cattle. I've seen a different species used in California. I'd let, maybe You'll know, maybe your dad uses subterranean clover to feed your moomoos. Anyway, subterranean clover and skeleton weed are both kind of weedy and they can take over large areas. So this was an experience comparing their competitive ability to each other. And so they were looking at um, below ground 
root competition, and then they looked at um, shoot competition above ground, and then they looked at both of those together. So to look, compare just root competition, all they did is put a divider between them so that they had separate individual spaces that they were competing with above ground, but their roots could compete. And what they found is that the subterranean clover um, reduced growth in the skeleton weed by, na by 35%. And then when they put them in different pots, so their roots had lots of space to grow, but they were confined to the same above ground sp space, sub Training clover inhibited the skeleton weed even farther, and then it's like a double whammy if you try to grow them in the same pot. The subterranean clover is just like pew, 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 bang, wham, and knocks out the skeleton weed. So there are a lot of plants compete not only above ground with other species, but also below ground for root space. But all competition is going to be relative to the environment that organisms are living in. And I think the all the invasive species we've talked about so far in this class are an excellent example of that because um, something becomes invasive because it lacks a competitor. Actually, this is gonna be in the next slide, but something becomes invasive because it lacks a competitor in this new area that it's moved to. It's a perfect demonstration of how competition is all relative to the environment, um, the time of year, lots of different factors come to play. And this is just a graph um, showing that um, differences in competitive ability between these three thistle species based on the relative um, concentration of nutrients in the soil that they're growing in. Uh, I actually fixed, this is an image that was, another image from the textbook that we've, I found an error in. Uh, I know what Syllabum marianum looks like because I've collected bees off it in the field and they had this picture and this picture switched, so I fixed it on this PowerPoint slide. But they grew these three species of thistle together in a pot. And what they found is that this Carthamus was the best competitor at relatively low nutrient concentration. So the growth of these two other species is inhibited when they don't have much nutrition available. But it looks like um, this Carthamus species is able to grow pretty well without nutrition. But it like medium nut nutrient concentration the Carduus pycnocephalus thistle um, seems to win out. And so this must be the optimal amount of nutrition for its increased growth rate that allows it to overtake the other two species. And then at really high nutrient concentrations, there's probably some limit to the growth rates of Carduus and Carthamus. There's probably a limit to the growth rate that they're capable of. Um, but Syllabum marianum, which is a pretty common invasive thistle, if the nutrient concentration is high, they must have a higher growth rate um, at higher nutrient concentration levels. They may not be limited, and that's why in high nutrient environments, they can outcompete the other two species. So let's talk about how competition might influence the niche that an organism occupies. Um, so I basically just talked about competitive release earlier. So competitive release is when a species niche expands in response to the removal of a competitor. You can kind of think of invasive species that way, except they're moving to a new land. Um, more specifically, competitive, a perfect example of competitive release is all over the freaking place in Pennsylvania and it right there. Um, there are deer everywhere in Pennsylvania and it's because we have significant humans have significant significantly reduced the populations of their predators usually wolves um, without the wolves around to control the deer population their niche has expanded and now they're all over the freaking place even in my backyard in like Pittsburgh proper, they still come in and eat all of my tiny, my little native plants I've planted in my backyard, and they're not scared of nothing. So that's an example of competitive release. Um, this is another example that's not an invasive species, the kakapo that we talked about earlier, which um, we talked about why it might have have evolved giant giantism. 
on an island, and that might be because there's a lack of a predator slash competitor on um, another island, or maybe there's no other bird species to compete with for the food resources they eat, and that allows them to grow to a larger size. Um, it might be beneficial for them to be a larger size in the environment that they're in because it allows them to use more resources through intraspecific competition. So that's competitive release. This is another study looking at competitive release with three-spined stickleback. If you remember, they're the ones with the little gill rakers that let them eat uh, like copepods or artemis artemisia, which are brine shrimp. Um, and their main comp competitor in this environment that they were looked at in is juvenile trout. They eat the same uh, food types as these stickleback, and so they looked what would happen if you eliminated trout from the environment, um, and then they compared that to their top total population niche width, which was probably um, calculated with like measures of population density and geographic area in the lake and things like that. And what they found is that um, every time their competitor, which is juvenile trout, almost every time um, the trout was removed, you would then see a following increase in the population. Uh, so this is two different experiments where you can, or actually it's one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so when the trout, their competitor for their food resources is eliminated, the population can expand. They can reach higher growth rates, higher birth rates, because more individuals are getting food. So now let's talk a little bit about partitioning of resources and species coexistence. So we talked about how with the competitive exclusion principle, you can't have any complete competitors. And so what sometimes happens in environments where two things that share resources are forced to compete is that you'll see um, specialization into different parts of um, an ecological niche so that there's less direct competition between species. So the formal definition for character displacement is when a shift in, in niches involves features of a species morphology, behavior, or physiology. And these are two really good examples here from your textbook. This is a study of small cat species that co-occur in Israel. Um, and the size of their canine teeth, and so this actually includes uh, intraspecific competition too between males and females um, of species as well. Oh, yeah, look, those ones, I don't know what, why didn't they put them together? They haven't found another textbook. Oh, they didn't because they don't fall in line. They wanted to make a nice line. But this is looking at intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. And what they found is that males and females of these three species that live in Israel all have different mean diameters of their canine teeth and the diameter of the canine teeth dictates the size of the prey that they're able to eat. Um, and so this is an, an example where all of these organisms probably millions and millions of years ago in evolutionary time where competitors and then the selection pressure of competition caused this character displacement so that they were no longer competing for the same food resources. Another good example here in plants, looking at prairie plants and root depth, um, a lot of really cool stuff happens in prairies below the surface of the soil um, because there's lots of weird, interesting competition going on between the roots of plants there. We'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about succession. Um, so this is comparing smartweed, which we saw out at Winnie Palmer. That's a picture I took during our lab um, that's named after Pennsylvania. And then Indian mallow and then this bristly foxtail plant that all occur in prairies. Um, and what you see is that they all access um, different parts of the soil horizon profile by reaching their roots deeper and deeper into the soil so that they're not competing in the same uh, three-dimensional, two-dimensional space with these other prairie plant species. And so they're feeding it nutrient on probably different nutrients that are based on the decomposition. So, you know, usually what we learned about soil 
is that at deeper depths you have less decomposed soil, at the top you have more decomposed soil, and so they probably have different nutrient requirements um, that allow them to use different nutrients in different parts of the soil horizon. So, that's it. Uh, that's it for, for exam two. Um, I will check the doodle poll right after this to see when our next exam review will be, ex or multiple exam reviews. So, okay, that's it. See you on the flippy floppy. Bye-bye. <laughs>